Hey, what's up you guys? I'm Sarah Labrat and today I'm going to be reviewing Harlan Coben's BBC Maestro class on writing thrillers. This one I'm very much looking forward to reviewing because I disagreed with a lot of the things he said. So if you go on to enjoy this video, I'd really appreciate it if you could give it a big thumbs up because that really supports my channel. Subscribe if you're not already. And now without further ado, let's get into talking about Harlan Coben's creative writing class. This class is four and a half hours long, broken down into 23 different lessons. It's also set up in such a way where you you can take this class along with writing your book instead of just binge watching the class like I did. And as the class goes on, he gives you tasks, which is basically like homework that you can complete as you're watching this course to work on improving your story as you take the class. Overall, other than the things that I did not agree with, which we will touch on, I do think that this was a very actionable course. And I think the tasks really play into that. And even though we're not going to be touching on all 23 lessons today, we are going to be delving into a couple of them a little bit more than others. And then just skimming through a few of the other ones. If you wanna take this class for yourself, there will be a link down in the description box below. And now let's start reviewing this course. I want to change your entire life. I've written 36 thrillers. I've had over a dozen number one New York Times bestsellers. I have over 10 TV series and movies around the world. And this is why I'm ready to be the one to teach you all the things that I've learned over these years. We're also going to talk to my editor and my agent. So we're going to cover all aspects of both the writing and the publishing. Obviously I've already taken this class and now we're talking about it, but I was pumped up after this course trailer. And two of the lessons that we will be touching on are him talking with his editor and him talking with his agent. First thing we're going to do is do a little bit about the writer's mind frame to get you started. I want you to start to think like a writer. No matter what else you get out of this course, I want you to start seeing the world a little bit differently. There are three things that make a writer and we're going to go through. The first one is inspiration. The second one, is perspiration. That is the work involved in writing. The third and perhaps most important is desperation. And that is you, like me, are probably unfit to do anything else other than write. If you are fit to do something else other than write, if you don't have to write, don't write. Believe me, this is kind of hard. I'm not saying it's the hardest thing in the world. It's not digging ditches or anything like that. But if you're not desperate for it, if you don't really, really want it, it's not going to happen. It's just not. Inspiration, perspiration, desperation are all separate lessons within this masterclass that we will be touching on a little bit. I liked that thought because I've always thought about the inspiration, but I've never heard then also paired with perspiration and desperation. And I think desperation might be my favorite of the three, but we'll get into that in a few minutes. Let me give you a caveat that we're gonna start off with. First of all, if you ask 10 writers how they do it, you'll get 11 different answers. So I'm hoping you learn from me and I hope you also pick up your own way of doing it. And as obvious as that may seem, I do like the note of everybody writes differently. There is no right or wrong answer, which is often why getting started as a writer, especially as like a young writer is so difficult, is because you're looking for like a how-to guide. And unfortunately, no such things exist. Everybody writes differently, everybody approaches writing differently, everybody needs to go into the writing process knowing varying degrees about what their story is going to hold. One final thing before we get started. It's never too late. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a pro basketball player. That dream is over. It's not going to happen. You're not going to be a pro athlete either. But I don't care how old you are. I don't care where you are at your stage of life. You can be a published novelist. You can be a screenwriter. You can have a successful TV series or a movie. I know people who are 70 years old who can publish for the first time, even 80. The only time that you fail here is when you quit, and I'm not gonna let you quit. It's never too late. I do very strongly believe that. I believe that creativity is a muscle and you can get into writing or any creative field at any point in your life. And all you have to do is work on exercising your creativity in order to get closer to that, but it is possible to pick up at any point in time. Age doesn't matter. You're never too young. You're never too old to start writing or keep writing or return to writing. And that was just lesson number one, which was the introduction. And I was already fired up for this class at that point. But then we really start the course with lesson number two, which is being a writer. Everything you do is going to be material. Most of your ideas is going to come from your real life, actually. Flaubert says in terms of writing, uh, be regular and orderly in your real life so you can be violent and original in your work. You are now going to be thinking about trying to write all the time. You have to fight to be a writer. You have to fight to get the time to write. 
let's first of all get rid of any excuses that you have, because I'm not accepting any excuses. But this is the key, this is how I try to live my life. Does it help me produce pages? Good. Does it not help me produce pages? Bad. As simple as that. Try to live your life that way. You need to fight for your time. You are a writer. So you have to think about that. This also means some stuff that's kind of fun. You have to go to museums. You have to keep filling up your head. You have to watch movies and TV. You have to read a lot of books. You have to do all of those things to fill up your own mind with stuff that you can eventually turn and twist and put through your processes in order to start getting you to produce the work um, that you want to produce. So that's one of the big things that I did not like about this class is that it's very much like a tough love class, like suck it up, figure it out, do it kind of a thing. And I know that that does not work for a lot of people. I am not necessarily one of those people who likes the tough love kind of approach, but if you're into that, great. This class has a lot of that. But also if you're not as into that, it is easy to just kind of skip over those portions or, you know, just kind of take it with a grain of salt. You have to be desperate to write and you have to be desperate to be published. I'm sorry you do. If you're here just to write for yourself, I'm not the guy for you. Go to some other class. That's called therapy. That's not called right. I was there once. I know how badly you want to be published. I know how much you want to see your book in a store. I know you want to open that box and take out that book. And I want that for you. And so you keep that in mind. There's nothing wrong with having that sort of thing. You have to be desperate. This is hard enough. If you don't really, really want it, it's not going to happen. But that's a big part of the desperation lesson. He's a little intense about it, but I do very strongly believe in protecting your writing time and or being inventive with finding writing time throughout your day, whether it's little pockets of time, waking up half an hour earlier, going to bed half an hour later, writing at lunch, whatever it is. I do believe that there is time to write. You just have to find it. We all believe that we are uniquely complex, but we can read everybody else, right? You always think, well, no one knows what I'm really thinking but I got a pretty good idea of what that person's thinking. And of course that can't be true. No, you don't. So that's the kind of thing that you can explore. Every single person you see, you're walking in the street, you're in school, every single person has hopes and dreams. And it's a really simple thought when you think about it. Everybody has hopes and dreams. But start with that when you're creating a character. Every single person you know has hopes and dreams. What are they? How does it affect them? Does that make them more human to me? Do I not get that? They're not just somebody in the background and not somebody, they are you. What are your hopes and dreams? What are their hopes and dreams? In one of my creative writing classes in college, one of our exercises that we needed to do was go out on the street, find somebody, kind of like jot down their description and then try to come up with while not knowing anything about this person in real life, try to come up with a secret that they have, a hope that they have, and then like something they're ashamed of or something like that. And just start to like build up character backgrounds in making all of your characters, not just your main characters, a little bit more 3D. Writing routines, we're gonna get into a little bit more later on, but I do wanna stress a little bit something. First of all, my job is to help you find the way you're going to do it. Also, I change up. So some writers, have a desk, they always sit there, they get there. My friend John Grisham, John Grisham wakes up every morning, he has a little cottage behind his house, he has no internet in it, because that there at the same time every day, finishes the same time, I'm not like that. I have different routines that I do and I use up different things, trying different things until I find what's working and I do it for a while. It's like I'm riding a horse, the horse is going along nicely, I really push that horse, the horse dies, now I gotta find the new horse. Find what routine you're going to do, but it's okay to keep changing up what that routine is. So when I was younger, I wrote better at night. I was a guy who would start at eight o'clock, I'd write till two in the morning. A little older now, I'm better off in the mornings. I'm better off seven or eight a.m. starting, I finish around noon. Your writing routine can change, and I find a lot of comfort in this idea, but at the same time, that kind of freaks me out because I do really like my routine, which is often that I write the best between 11 p.m. and two in the morning, and I tend to do my best writing at my desk. Normally, my desk is in front of the window, but 
for the sake of filming this video, we had to move it back to its original location, which is right here for the much better lighting in my apartment. But I liked that he mentioned John Grisham's writing cabin that he goes to every day because I filmed a video a while ago about famous authors writing spaces. And one of my favorite spaces within that video was actually Neil Gaiman's because he has like a little, I want to call it a gazebo because it's about gazebo size, but it has walls and windows and everything in his backyard in the middle of the woods that he goes to and he writes in. And that is like the ultimate dream for me is to have something like that, that I can call like my little writing cabin that's outside of my house that I can go to to write. That can be like my designated writing spot. And my hope with that someday, eventually when I have a house, ideally in the forest or the mountains, is that then I can go out to that space to write, which is then separate from the rest of my life and my living space. Because right now in a one bedroom apartment, it's all very much in one space. I'm always writing. Again, part of the writer's mind frame. My friends even know that I'm sometimes rude. Like they'll be talking to me and they'll see me looking off and I'll go, oh, Harlan's gone off to La La Land again. That's part of it. That's just, you know, hopefully your friends will understand, your family will understand. This has to be your priority. It doesn't mean that you're ignoring your family. I love my family, I have four kids. Believe me, they're around me plenty. But they also know that this is a part of me, that I disappear, that I go off sometimes into my own tangents. If I start to think of something, that takes priority. I will suddenly grab a pad and paper and I will just start jotting things down. Get the things down, but live with this mind frame that you are going to be thinking about writing as often as you can. So I both agree and disagree with this. I didn't like how he said it came across as rude to his friends and stuff sometimes, because even if I'm in the middle of a conversation and I come up with something, I will like discreetly pull out my phone to jot something down, but it's never like I completely ignore the person that's talking to me, but I also know that everybody's different. Okay, so if you're a writer, you're also gonna use any excuse you can not to write, right? There's sometimes I'll be sitting at home saying, I'm gonna write, but first, let me put wood paneling in my base. You'll do anything to avoid that terrifying moment you have to sit in front of a black screen. So I want you to eliminate any sort of things that can get in the way of you starting to write. You don't need four hours, you don't need six hours. You could do stuff in a half hour, even 15 minutes. I always carry this backpack with me. I never let anything get in my way. There's also snacks in here, I'm not gonna show those to you. I never let anything get in the way of me wanting to write. I don't wanna be able to say, oh, I'll write, but I don't really have, no. Just get down to it and start writing. So I keep this with me wherever I go. If you're just going to the city, if you're visiting a friend, I'll keep it in the car. But even if I'm going to meet somebody, I have this backpack with me, I'll get there a little early. That's 15 or 20 minutes that I can actually get stuff done. Just get to it. I love this concept of always being ready. I am not as ready as he is with his full backpack full of everything he might possibly want to write on or with, but I do love that concept just to basically have no excuses whatsoever not to write when you suddenly get an idea. But it might also be like the Gen Z in me where I can just pull out my phone and write something down quickly. But I do really appreciate that a well-established author like this really takes the time to mention that writing doesn't have to take up four or six hours, but to always be ready and utilize the time that you do have. One of my favorite techniques that I like to use is writing sprints, which is quite literally that, taking like 15, 20, 30 minutes to write for that amount of time. You can either set a timer or not set a timer. I think setting a timer stresses me out. But then when that writing sprint is done, I get up, I do something else, and then after a little while, I come back to writing and do another writing sprint. Because I can just feel so stuck if I'm not writing as fast as I want to be during those longer blocks of time. I think that I wrote maybe three novels before I had one published. I don't look at that as a waste and neither should you. You can have the talent of Michael Jordan. If I put you on a basketball court and you've never played basketball before, you're not gonna be good. Why do you think that's different for writing? Writing is one of the few activities where quantity will inevitably make quality. You have to do the work involved. So I look at those early novels as lessons in writing. They taught me better how to eventually write a novel. I also just didn't give up. I never thought of it like those novels were failures. Finish it, get it done, and then do it again. The first thing I did when I finished my first novel, and I tell this to people who say, I just finished a novel, I'm gonna send it out to try to be published. What should I do now? Write the second one. Because your first novel is first of all, not as good as you think, trust me. You think it's great, it's not. Start writing the second one right. Don't just sit around, get started on the next one. You just climb this wonderful mountain. 
but now you're seeing the other mountain in the distance. You want to go for that one as soon as you can. When you first start writing, quantity will eventually bring you quality. The first book that I wrote was definitely not the best book I've written, but I will acknowledge that I needed that practice in order to write the book that I'm writing right now, which I think is significantly better than the first book I wrote. First of all, let's get the first draft down. I try to write turning off all of those voices in my head that tells me I suck. I have them too. Stephen King has them. John Grisham has them. Every one of your favorite writers has them. We all think we suck at some moment. You have to turn off that voice and just write and keep in the back of your mind that you're going to be able to rewrite it later. So just get the words down. Other writing courses that I've taken have also really emphasized that finishing things is going to be the most helpful thing in your writing process and learning how to be a better writer. Neil Gaiman says it, Brandon Sanderson says it, just write things and finish them. The other thing I recommend is that you do not talk about your book with friends. Other people will tell you the opposite or talk it out. I don't agree with that. I think you need to harness that energy. I'm writing a book right now. I am dying to tell you what the book is about. But the only way I'm going to get that satisfaction is to actually write the book. Because if I start talking about it, it's almost like a balloon. Like, oh, my book is about... I can start feeling the air going out. The only way I'm going to get the satisfaction, the joy of being able to tell you about this wonderful, great story is to actually write it. If you're a writing group, that's something different. But for general, or without one trusted friend that you want to do it with, don't tell people you're writing. Don't do any of that sort of thing. Keep it to yourself. Use up all that energy and let the only way for that energy to escape is to actually write and publish the novel. This part I do really agree with. Sometimes I'll get really excited and I'll tell my friends that I came up with a new book idea or I'll even like vlog and I'll say like, oh, I came up with a new shiny book idea that I really want to work on. And then people will be like, oh my gosh, what's it about? And I'll be like, I don't want to tell you yet because that's going to make this not feel like it's mine anymore. And I need the book to feel like it's mine at least through the rough draft so that I can get the idea on the page before I start telling other people about it, which has helped me start really protecting my ideas and really getting excited about finishing the first draft so that then I can tell people about them. Inspiration from the inspiration, perspiration, and desperation part of this course is broken down into two sections, inspiration in the idea and inspiration in practice. For inspiration the idea, he does say to write all of your ideas down and save them, and this is something that I do. I have so many ideas documents. I have ideas documents for each of the books that I've written and am working on. I have general ideas documents. I'm sure I have countless countless notes in my phone about random spontaneous ideas that have popped up. But the thing is that I write them all down and I save them in case it comes into play or works with an idea in the future that I have. But all in all, save your ideas because you never know what is going to pop up that might help enhance a later book concept. Anything can get you an idea. This is what I mean. Keep your mind open. I was on a hike with my family. I hate hiking. I don't get it. I know we're all supposed to be into hiking now. I find it really boring. I'm like, oh, there's a tree. There's another tree. Bring me to the city where I can look at, uh, let me go through a bookstore. Let me browse through a bookstore. Let me shop, window shop. Let me see people's faces. All of that stuff. Yeah, I love all that. But the woods, I'm so bored. It's hot. There's mosquitoes. <laughs> The notes that I took on this literally just say, can't relate. I love hiking. I love being in the mountains. I love being in the trees. I'm not gonna be sharing a lot of footage from this lesson, but within this lesson, he says that it takes him about three months to come up with an idea. And then he goes through and gives examples from a bunch of his books and how he came up with the ideas for them. And listening to him talk about this was sparking a lot of ideas for me. I was jotting things down for my own stories. And it was some of the most helpful advice on idea generation that I've seen in a writing class. And it was more specific than the general, oh, you can get ideas from anywhere and everywhere, because a lot of the times really broad advice like that isn't actually that helpful. So again, this video is not sponsored, but if you want to check out this class, there is a link down in the description box below. So now we're going into the lesson called Inspiration in Practice. I have pages and pages at home of ideas, most of which will never see the light of day. Some of the things that I've collected, I write them down in different notebooks. I then will put them in a central file. Some of those ideas that I go through before I start a new book to see if something will stimulate it are 30 or even 40 years old that I've had in those things. And maybe we'll never see the light of day, or maybe now, finally, we'll get their chance to shine. So you have to decide what's a good idea, what's not a good idea, 
But besides that, some things may turn into good ideas later on. So don't ever dismiss it. Don't ever throw it away. This is why you save your ideas because you never know at what point even in his case, 35 to 40 years down the line, those ideas might become helpful for another story you're writing or those ideas might finally get to see the light of day. Harlan is the kind of writer that knows the beginning of his story and the end of his story, but he doesn't know how he's going to get from point A to point B. He calls himself a headlights writer because he knows just about as far in front of him as you can see with like the headlights in a car. And through that method, he can get from the beginning to the end of the book. That's also relatively what I consider myself to be. I call myself a pantser, but I do know how the story is going to end. I do know roughly where the story is going to start, but with the first book that I wrote, um, I did not know that information yet. And so I ended up having to cut out the first 80 pages of the book because where I thought the story started was 80 pages into what I had actually written. And then we get to the lesson on perspiration, which is the work. And this is really where I start to disagree with Harlan. Perspiration, and that is the actual work of being a writer because it's all that matters. At the end of the day, you have to write. Creating characters is not writing. Outlining is not writing. Watching me is not writing. Research is not writing. Hanging with your friends at a coffee shop is not writing. Reading is not writing. Only writing is writing. Write that down. Only writing is writing. The only thing that really counts is the moments that you have your butt in a chair and are producing words. Everything else is flotsam and jetsam. Everything else is fun and part of it, but if you don't have that, you have nothing. One of my favorite quotes on writing is, amateurs wait for the muse to arrive, the rest of us just get to work, right? A plumber can't wake up in the morning and say, oh, you know what, today, today I can't do pipes. You have to do the work. You have to have that. And, that, and let me just point out that the muse is not some angelic bird sitting on your shoulder singing you happy songs. It's more like my mother's voice on a front end. What? You want to go out with friends? No one calls me? How come you're not hanging here? Come on, you should be doing this. It's nagging. It's annoying. It'll get on your nerves, but you have to do all of those sort of things. So I agree with part of this that you can brainstorm for forever, but if you never write it down, it's not ever going to be written down. But also if you don't do any brainstorming, you have a house with no foundation instead of the other way around. Whereas if you do the brainstorming, then you have a foundation to start with. I do think that he's more trying to say, like, don't spend all of your time just brainstorming and never starting. But I would argue that brainstorming definitely has a place in any creative's life. The hardest word is the first word to write. You just sit down. Sometimes I'll just sit down and I'll take out the pen or paper or I'll go right to the laptop and I'll just start writing down, man, I'm not in a good mood today or I'm angry at myself or I better start writing. I do agree that sometimes like the blank page is like a terrifying place, which is why I sometimes recommend writing in different colors or different fonts that just feel a little bit less serious. But I like how he says that he can start a writing session by just like literally, I'm gonna call it journaling, that he's not in a good writing mood, that he's not in a good mood overall, that he doesn't wanna be doing this. And then there's something on the page so that it's not the blank page syndrome anymore. But this next thing is where I don't agree with him. Part of it is also loathing, self-loathing. If I don't write, I yell at myself. I get mad at myself. That's part of, I am a writer, right? We talked about this, it's the writer's mind frame. You're not a writer if you're just doing the writer's mind frame, but you're not writing. So that's what I don't really agree with, with the, the majority of this class is like the tough love portions. The self-loathing and yelling at himself, if he's not writing, I feel like people need a lot more self-compassion than that. I know that a lot of people like don't work well with that mentality. I know that I, for one, do not work well with that mentality. And then again, it works really well for some people. But I also know that some people will beat themselves up about it and then still not write. And that is just like not healthy. Sometimes the process might be good, Sometimes the process might be bad, but creativity, creation, that's always good. When I finish for the day and I have a done chapter, paragraph, whatever it is, I think about it. There was nothing there before. Before you started to write that, there's absolutely nothing. It was a blank page. Now there's something created that didn't exist before that only you can create. And if that's not a marvel to you, then you again shouldn't be taking this course. You're in the wrong business. That's the beauty of it. So even if the process isn't magical, it doesn't have to be. The creation is 
to see your book at the end of the day, to see what you finish doing. This is where we get back to, oh, okay, like I agree with what he's saying. Perspiration matters because putting something on the page is one of the more rewarding parts of writing. Like when you finally figure something out, when you like finish writing a chapter, when you finish writing a scene or an act, or eventually when you get to the end and you get to write the end at the end of your book, or you finish a draft, or like you start querying or something, the little wins matter and you will only achieve those milestones by putting in the work. And now we're gonna get into the lesson on desperation. We've done inspiration a bit, we've done perspiration a bit, and now the third, which to me is the most important, and probably the one people don't think about the most, is desperation. And that is, I'm not fit to be anything other than a writer. I have no other marketable skills, and probably neither do you. There's nothing else I can do. I was once on a panel with a bunch of writers, and somebody asked the question, this we sometimes will get, if you weren't a writer, what would you be? And one of my friends goes, oh, I think I'd be a U.S. Senator. And I'm like, oh, please, I'd be a duvet cover. I got nothing else. And that desperation, the fact that I know I'm not good at anything else, makes me want to be a writer even more. And I hope you have that feeling. Not that you're incompetent in everything else. That's just part of my own personality. But you have that desperation that you have to be a writer. I did choose to major in creative writing in college just because that was the thing that I was most interested in and I knew would hold my attention. And my goal for a very long time has been to be or to get to the point of being a full-time author. I held some jobs that I was not interested in before I quit to become self-employed and work for myself as I'm still working towards that goal of becoming a full-time author. And I know that I have other interests and hobbies and nobody is truly that one note that writing is the only thing that exists in your life. But I I did think that he said that he would be a duvet cover if he didn't have writing. No one's going to rescue you. You're on your own. You're by yourself. No one's going to help you. There's nothing truer than that when you're writing a book. You are on your own and that's great. That's the great thing about being a writer. So you have to have that desperation. You have to have that hunger. You have to want to see your name in print. There's the old saying about the Berkeley tree in the woods. You know, the tree falls in the woods and nobody hears it. Does it make a sound? As a writer, the answer is if no one reads me, I don't exist as a writer. I have to be heard. The sound has to come out. And the more people who hear it, the more I'm a writer. That's how I feel. The larger my audience, the more you're a writer. Think about that. It just makes logical sense if one person hears the tree fall versus more than one person. This is something I disagree with. The number of readers that you have or whether or not you have any readers does not make you any more or any less of a writer. I think this kind of goes back to the concept of you are a writer if you write, you are an author if you have finished something, and you are a published author if you have published a piece of work. Do your own thing, find that way, stay motivated, work your butt off on it, Become obsessed. That's the final thing I'll say on this particular topic is obsession. I am obsessed with my story. I am distracted all the time. I am thinking about even now as I'm doing this, these pads that are sitting next to me, when we're taking breaks, I'm jotting down notes and thoughts that may end up working for the story. It's okay to have that little bit of obsession if it keeps you motivated. I love that he touched on trends because I feel like a lot of the advice that's out there, while it's like, yes, like, you know, write what you want to write, write for yourself, but also like keep in mind what people are buying and what's selling. When you come up with the idea for a book, it's gonna take you a year or a couple years to write that book. And then especially if you were a debut author and you're trying to traditionally publish, it's going to take it's going to take a year and a half to two years to publish for the first time. And then suddenly that trend that you were trying to jump on is no longer a trend. So an agent might not wanna pick it up, just writing what you truly believe in because that can very much be picked up by the reader or an agent or somebody that is looking at your book for the first time. They can tell if you care about the subject matter or not. Writing more do it the better you get the muscle has to get developed you can't just come to the gym once every six months to start lifting weights you got to do it steadily every day if you can i try to write a little bit every day i'm going to encourage you to do it every single day if you can it doesn't have to be a lot 
just start. Writing is a muscle. I say that in a lot of my videos. A lot of people in my real life, when I tell them that I'm a writer for the first time, the most common response that I get back to that is the other person saying, oh, I'm not a creative person or I could never do that, which is just not true. And I try to tell people that, but of course, if somebody doesn't want to hear it, they won't listen to it. But creativity is a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it will get. Also, if you are relatively new to writing, it might be wise to start off slower just to work on building that muscle over time instead of just immediately going in, trying to write 2000 words in a day and just completely burning out. It might be better to try and write 50 words a day or 100 words a day for a couple days and then slowly start eking that up just to work on growing that muscle. And I want you to type up a little thing that I used to put on my computer for a long time because I, this is really important. You only fail when you quit. As long as you're still in this game, as long as you're taking swings, as long as you're still writing, you haven't failed yet. You haven't failed until you quit. Get knocked down seven times, get up eight. As long as you keep writing, you have not failed. Now we're really gonna start speeding up through some of these lessons, but I did wanna touch on something in the research lesson, is that Harlan suggests not over-researching because you can get frozen in researching and trying to figure out absolutely everything about a field. You can invest like dozens of hours into something and not really have it matter. And so his suggestion, which I thought was really interesting, was to call someone or talk to somebody in the field to pick up that one detail that you will not find from hours and hours of research that will make it feel so much more real. I'm not gonna touch on the lesson on plot today just because that's not something that I need at this point in my writing journey, mostly because I'm working on draft six of my book. So plot is not necessarily something I'm looking for. Again, I'm skipping over a lot of information in this class. If you want the rest of the information, I suggest watching the whole thing. I'm also also gonna skip over characters and then we get to villains. The idea is that these guys by seeming normal and by doing strange things like singing to one another makes them in the end scarier and more interesting than if I just had two psycho killers sitting there with scars on their faces holding knives talking about how much they love the sight of blood. By making the world normal that they are in you can actually make it more frightening. And then he has a lot of other interesting ideas within this lesson and the character lesson about how to invert expectations. And especially in this villain segment, he talks about how inverting expectations can make a character or the villain a lot scarier. The next lesson we're going to be touching on is starting from the middle. Try to get me to start at the most important part of the story. We are always interrupting a life. I had to learn this the hard way, as I've already mentioned in that first book that I wrote, where I was having a great time writing the story until I got to my second revision of the book. And then I was like, oh, the story doesn't actually start or like get interesting until 80 pages in, which is then when I had to cut out 80 pages of the beginning of that book. I really wanna zero in on what he said about you are interrupting someone's life. Like you are jumping in right at that moment. You don't need to know everything about the character before the book begins so you can learn some of those things later on but you need to start with something that will cause a lot of intrigue so that you can keep your readers attention in the lesson setting and atmosphere his main point is to make it short sweet and specific he then goes into some really great details on how to do this but we're just going to breeze past that lesson and dialogue and suspense and secrets we're also skipping over pacing plot twists and rabbit holes but again great lessons i'm just not going to be touching on them in this video and the next thing we're going to talk about is reframing writers Block. The problem with the term writer's block is I'm picturing you're traveling down the road and all of a sudden this gigantic block of concrete has just dropped in front of you. I think perhaps the way to think of it is not always to just barrel through, try to punch your way through, try to kick your way through, but sometimes that block is telling you to take another route. You can go around the block. You can back up and turn right. You can back up and you can turn left. You can try to climb over. The idea is it's not necessarily a block. It's probably encouraging you to do something different. At times, it actually is a positive. Maybe your story right now is a little too smooth. Maybe your hero is going through stuff that isn't enough. He has to have more obstacles in his way. So you as a writer are being thrown into that obstacle. How do I work to get around it? First of all, I try to change up my environment. If I'm writing at night, I start writing during the day. If I'm writing in my house, I write outside my house. If I'm writing on my computer, I go back to my old pen. If I've been working in a coffee shop, maybe I'll change up and I'll work someplace else or work in a house. My own method of writing, my own writer's routine 
is to constantly change my writer's routine. I don't have one. I don't like having one. You may. Again, some writers are very anal about it. They get up, they do this at the same time. That's how they get through writer's block, through routine. I am the opposite. I wanted to share this part of the writing class because this is basically in opposition to what Neil Gaiman says. Because Neil Gaiman talks about, okay, if you have run into a writing block, that just means that you took a wrong turn somewhere. So you just need to go back a couple chapters, reread it and figure out what feels more correct with the direction of the story. Which while that's totally fair and completely works in some situations, I really like this different perspective of changing your process by changing where you write or what time you write or what method you are using to write. Like if you normally write on your computer, switch over to writing by hand. Just something to make the writing feel different and that might fix the block you're feeling. Sometimes writer's block isn't because you're stuck and there are no avenues. Sometimes it's because there's too many avenues. We talked a little bit before about how choice makes you freeze up. It's the same thing here. It's the problem isn't that there's nowhere to go. The problem is there's too many places to go and you're afraid you're going to go down the wrong route. It's life. Life is a series of sliding doors, right? If you went right instead of left, your whole life would be different. It's okay then. Your story's gonna be one way or the other. Take one of those routes, commit to it. Here's the beauty of being a writer. You can always redo it. So choose one of those avenues that's in front of you. Take one of those choices. Don't let it paralyze you. And if it doesn't work out, 99% of the time it will. But if it doesn't work out, you can always go back to where that block was created and go to the left instead of the right and see what it does. This concept reminds me of decision fatigue where there are just sometimes too many options. Decision fatigue can apply to a lot of areas of life and especially when you are like quite literally the god and the creator of a world as you're writing something. When the plot or the characters could go in literally any direction, it can make you freeze up and feel like you're stuck when in reality you should just pick something because you can always change it later. If you start going down a path and decide that that's not the best fit for the story. But there are times very late at night or very first thing in the morning when I'll come up with the answer, especially first thing in the morning. I actually have one of my other little secrets. You can get this online someplace. I have a waterproof pad that's in my shower with one of those pens. I have it hung there. I oftentimes come up with ideas while I'm in the shower. Aqua notes. Hang on. Aquanotes. This thing is a lifesaver. I have them hung up in my shower here. I need to get a new pad. I have them at my parents' house in Minnesota. They are linked down in the description box below. They're relatively inexpensive. It's literally a pad of waterproof paper with suction cups that you stick up in your shower. It comes with a pencil and a suction cup holder for the pencil so it can be sitting in your shower so that as you're coming up with ideas in the shower, you can jot them down. I highly recommend these. I talk about them all the time. The link is in the description box below. The next lesson is memorable ending. And I think that Harlan has a couple really good points in this lesson, but I also think that it's not nearly as specific as Brandon Sanderson's suggestions in his writing class. So if you want much more actionable advice on writing a satisfying ending, I would either go watch my review of his class or his free lectures available here on YouTube. But he does talk about writing multiple endings. Hopefully most of you already know something about the ending of your story. My task here, the task I want you to do, is that you have to really figure out the ending. And if you've got your ending, I want you to add to it. I want you to layer it. It's not enough to have one. I'm not even enough to have two. Give me three. Give me one ending that's even on the last page if you can. And then ask yourself this. Am I surprising people? Does this emotionally change how I feel about things? Am I shedding a little bit of a tear? It's kind of two and a half, if you will. That's my challenge for you. I don't want you to just come up with a simple ending that you already maybe came up with of who did it. Now let's layer that. Let's add to that. Let's make it heart-wrenching in some kind of way. I love this idea of building a satisfying ending by solving things in a way that layers and stacks the ending so that the ending still kind of has twists and turns as well as the rest of the story. All right, now we're getting into the two lessons where he sits down with his editor and his agent. This one is his editor. The rest of us admit that we do a lot of rewriting. How do I do it? I do it slightly different than most people. First of all, as I've mentioned several times before, just get the first draft down, throw it up, call it the shitty first draft, turn up all of those voices in your head that tells you you suck and write it. So we're talking about after that. I do it a little bit piecemeal. 
So when I write, I don't write like this, in a straight line across. I more write like this. Each day, I go back and I reread what I did the day before, and I rewrite it. It's almost like getting a running start. Every 75 pages or so, I go all the way back to the beginning, and I reread it and rewrite it. So by the time the book ends, by the time I completed my first draft, I've already rewritten chapter one eight or nine times. This is true of almost every writer you know, that they rewrite a lot. I don't know anybody who does it. I don't trust them, as I said. And then he goes into talking about different drafts and everything, but this method terrifies me. And I don't think it's good advice. It was not phrased like advice. That's what he said he did, but I would not personally recommend that advice to anybody. I do believe in the idea of the really rough first draft, the zero draft as some people call it, which is just you getting the idea out on the paper for yourself. But what I don't agree with is how he goes back every single day to look at and rewrite what he wrote the day before. I know that some people can get so stuck if they edit while they write like this because it's focusing far too much on perfecting what has already been written instead of focusing on writing more to finish the draft to then go back and improve the draft as a whole. I don't know when Harlan started doing this method. Maybe this is more recent. He does have 30 something books published. I don't know if this is how he has always written or if this is a much more recent development. Maybe after getting 35 books published, this would work because you kind of know what you're doing at that point, at least with story structure and everything. So you can go back and edit every single day as you go, which is again, terrifying. But I do not think that this is good advice for newer writers, especially writers that have not finished something before. I suggest doing it every day to get yourself a running start. If you can, go back every once in a while. That's also, by the way, a good way around writer's block. You go back, you see where you are, you get that running start toward that block, you might be able to leap right over it. That's a little bit closer to what Neil Gaiman said about writer's block, where you can go back a couple chapters, reread what you have to try and figure out where the block was. Just get the story down. Once you get the story down, you can fix it. I used an analogy before, but I'll repeat it here. It's like my diamond mining. You pick this ugly stone out of the ground, but that's where all the value is. Your second, your third, your fourth, your fifth, your sixth draft is when you're starting to cut it and polish it and remove it and put it on jewelry and making something that people want to wear, hopefully will adore. I like the diamond mining analogy. It reminds me a lot of one of the quotes that I have up here on my writing motivation board, which I don't know if you guys can see it, but it's this one. And it's a quote by Shannon Hale that says, I'm writing a first draft and reminding myself that I'm simply shoveling sand into a box so that later I can build castles. And now Harlan sits down with his editor. And usually I know it's coming right? Because I've not heard from you for two or three weeks. I start to sense that you're in the home stretch, and then an email shows up and I've got the manuscript and it's my job to read. And when you read it the first time, what are you looking for? What are you editing? What are you doing with it? So I'm really trying to be your first fan. I'm trying to read it like the reader who's going to get it as a finished book in six or nine months might read it. So I am just racing through it with your manuscripts full of twists and turns and fast paced. As I said, that it doesn't take me very long. And I'm just looking to enjoy myself. So you're just kind of at the first, it's almost a macro view of it. You're not looking for the minutiae. You're just trying to figure out, okay, I'm a patron in a bookstore. I bought this book. Would I enjoy it? Right. right. And so I'm not making a lot of notes. I'm not looking for small issues. If I notice something, I'll jot it down. Because usually the best editorial thoughts or the most uh, natural reactions to a book come in that first read. Or take little notes. I'll make little notes, but I'm not hand, head down editing page by page at that point. I'm trying to read it like your fans going to read. So I have not yet worked with an editor because I am not quite yet publishing, but I am getting a lot freaking closer. If you've been watching my writing vlogs, you know that we are getting a lot closer to me starting to query, which is really exciting. But I like this breakdown for at least their process of editing the book, where Harlan sends the book to his publisher. The publisher just like binge reads it, tries to read it as a reader, gets to enjoy it as a reader. If he notices anything that he feels like is going to need work, he'll jot it down. But he He's not line editing. He's not really nitpicking. He is just trying to enjoy the book 
get the sense of the book as a reader, and then they'll go back in and start making some of those smaller changes. They also talk about how they have a very specific relationship and the one round of edits with his editor is not normal for most authors, especially newer authors. Newer authors often need, they said like five to seven rounds of edits. But again, I assume that with Harlan and his 30 something books published, he has done this enough where he knows essentially what he needs to do to get the point to where it needs to be. You mentioned people to know, by the way, you mentioned titles. I would say of the 35 or so books that I've written, I may be titled seven or eight of them have been my titles. Oftentimes uh, I have a working title, but I'm not good with titles. It's not necessarily my forte. So sometimes it's a friend, you've entitled some, my wife, my kids. It's amazing how titles can come, in my case, from every place. There's no recipe and titles are really hard. You know it when you see it right. or when you read it, but until that point, boy, I've made many, many lists of potential titles for your books. <laughs> I should find those and, and archive them somewhere. Sometimes we send them like, oh, it's so bad. I'm glad to hear that I'm not the only one that's bad at titles. I also have working titles for my books. I abbreviate the original concept for my stories. So for example, Project DE. DE stands for the original thought process that I had behind my story. That original plotline ended up becoming the villain's backstory. And what DE stands for was never intended to be the title. It was just a placeholder because I had no idea what to title it for the first several years that I was working on this book. And then it wasn't until last year that I came up with the titles for all three books in the trilogy. And I know that publishers have strong opinions about titles. I know that often the title that you go into querying with is not the title that you end up with for publishing, but I am very confident and I do feel very strongly about the three titles that I came up with. I think they work really well together. I think they fit really, really well with each of the books and then as a whole unit. So of course I am hopeful that the titles that I came up with will be the titles that are used for this book, but I don't know that yet. I am completely with you. I think chasing trends is a fool's errand in book publishing. It takes a year to write a book in the best case for most people. Let's say it takes two or three or four years to write your first novel because you're just figuring it out. And culture moves at the speed of light. So what you think is a trend today, by the time that book's gonna get published, will be a distant memory, right? So I think the advice I give new writers is you've got to write the book that you have to write. And if it's good, if you're good, it'll find its market. I don't remember who said it and it's not up on my board, but there's another quote that says, write the book you want to read. And what I strongly believe within that is that if there is a book that you really want to read, there is at least one other person out there, if not a very large group of people that will also want to read that kind of book. And obviously in this video, I've been skipping around because this class has a lot of information in it. And I can obviously only share so many things with you guys, but this editing interview is about 20 minutes long and I thought it was very good. But one of my favorite parts is the one I'm about to show you. There seems to be a belief that the system's against you, that editors are against you or whatever else, but every day your editor, when they open up a manuscript sent by hopefully one of our people here, they want to fall in love. They want that to be the next thing that they're excited and published about. And that's, again, good news for the people out there who are working hard to try to do the best stuff they can. Successful editors get into the business because they have a passion for books and reading. It's not for the financial aspects of publishing, right? So yeah, that's what their goal is every day. And I give them the same advice that I give writers, which is you can only edit and publish the books that you love. You can't do it cynically. You can't say, I think this medical thriller is gonna find a market because I know of another medical thriller author who's really successful. I don't happen to like it, but I think there's a market. It's not gonna work. You're gonna spend so much time with that writer, that manuscript, that project, in success, you're gonna spend the next 15 years with that writer as you and I have, right? Yeah. And if you don't like it, if you don't love it, if it's not what you wanna be doing, it's gonna be such hard work. The system is not against you. Editors and agents go into their jobs every day wanting to find their new favorite read. I did tear up a little bit when I watched that portion because that just was like very comforting. In traditional publishing and even in self-publishing with using like an editor and a cover designer and a formatter, you want people who are passionate about your book. If somebody doesn't really, really, really want to be in your corner, that's okay. You will find somebody else out there that wants to be. I might need that reminder for myself. This next lesson, he sits down with his agent, which is really cool. And they talk a little bit about getting a literary agent. I think it's when I was starting out, and I think a lot of people who are starting out thinks it's, you know, you against the machine. You are David against Goliath and everybody is against you. But no, every time you're reading a query letter or a new manuscript, you're hoping to find the next thing, aren't you? That's absolutely true. Every query I start reading, I'm thinking this could be it. This could be that million dollar idea 
this could be that idea that's maybe not a million dollars, but I'm going to love it. Right. And there's a career here and it's going to be exciting and I'm going to be thrilled to represent this person. And the same thing happens when I start a manuscript. Maybe this person has a great idea. I'm really intrigued by it. I start reading. I want to love it. Right. It doesn't always work out, unfortunately. <laughs> but that's how I go into everything. You know, we're very enthusiastic. We're looking for that thing that we can support wholeheartedly. Again, just like a positive note that agents go into their jobs excited about finding the next big book or the next book that they're going to be super stoked about. I loved her comment about maybe not being like a million dollar idea, but knowing that somebody has a career in it. And that's what gets me. I just think it's so positive and such a good reminder. There are a lot of people writing as well and looking for an agent and Let's not forget, it's a totally subjective business. So if it's not right for me, it very well could be right for someone else. Again, you want a literary agent that is absolutely in love with your story. You don't want somebody who thinks it's fine. So when you start getting rejection letters from a querying, which is a very, very normal part of the process, you can kind of take that in stride and just know that they might have really enjoyed it and just not felt like they were either the perfect fit or that they thought another literary agent out there would be a better fit for you. Don't take a rejection as like a full rejection. It could just be like a not me, but you're going to find your other person. I think that makes you go, it's not quite getting there. Mm. One of the first most fundamental things is know who you're querying. Different agents have different interests, different tastes. So sometimes I'll get something that if I, I explicitly say, I'm not a science fiction person, don't send me science fiction, but I will get science fiction submissions and I will take a look at those, but they're pretty much going to be an immediate no for me. So the first step is do your research and know who you're querying. Know who you're querying. I have heard that the biggest reason that people get rejected is that they just shotgun query. They just basically write one query letter, they don't specialize it to the person they're submitting to, and they just shoot out their query and some sample pages, and they don't pay attention to what that agent is specifically looking for, because not everybody wants sample pages at first. Sometimes people just want a query letter, sometimes people want the query letter and the first chapter, sometimes people want the query letter in the first 50 pages. Last night, I started a spreadsheet of potential literary agents I might want to query in the future. And one of the people that I came across specifically asks for the query letter in the body of an email. They don't want it as an attachment. So make sure that you know who you're querying. That's huge. And then I think that this agent does a really good job of summarizing what should go into a query letter. And after listening to her talk about it, um, it makes me realize that mine is far too long. It's one page, but it is a full page and I should make it much more succinct, but that really makes me want to go back and look over it again and make some changes to make it much more succinct so that I can come across as a much better writer because I know how to pitch my book. That being said, we are now at the end of this creative writing course. If you are still watching, thank you so much for being here until the very end. And I just kind of wanted to go over the essence of this class. I did not touch on the majority of it. I did think it was very actionable. There were the couple areas that are much more tough -like lovey than compassionate, but I think if you go into the rest of this course knowing that, then you can approach it with a much better mindset. So if you want to check out the rest of this course, again, I encourage you to go through the link in my description. It is an affiliate link. These writing class reviews I do are not sponsored, but I do make a small commission if you choose to use my link, which I would really appreciate. I did very much enjoy this class, so thank you guys so much for watching this video today. Make sure you like and subscribe if you have not already, and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye!